third largest of the Great Lakes and sixth largest lake on Earth. What is the story behind this lake that makes up the northwest border of Indiana? Its history, as well as the topographic history of the state, started with the end of the last great ice age. This is Lake Michigan. Except for the cities and villages that line its shore, it looks much the way it did to the early explorers or to the Indians that inhabited this region before the explorers from Europe came. In terms of human history, the lake is virtually changeless. But Lake Michigan, as well as the other Great Lakes, is a recent addition to the landscape of North America. The history of the Great Lakes, as well as of most of the Midwest, including Indiana, is tied directly to the glaciers of the last Great Ice Age. It was the vast ice sheets that encroached upon this land from the north that carved the basins of the lakes and the water released from their melting filled these basins. Before the Ice Age, the region of North America now occupied by the Great Lakes was a plain that contained several broad river valleys. The geology of the region was determined in part by the existence of extensive inland seas during the Silurian period about 500 million years ago. At that time, what is now North America was straddling the equator. The inland sea that covered this portion of North America created a bowl-shaped basin. This basin became filled with layers of sediment which eventually became sedimentary rock. Some layers of rock were hard and resistant to weathering. Other layers were softer shales or sandstone that could weather more easily. When the glaciers invaded the region, the softer rock was more easily carved. A rim of hard dolomite, known as the Niagaran Formation, the speckled area shown here, encircles the inner Great Lakes region. The softer rock, both outside and inside this dolomite, was carved into the basins of the Great Lakes. The landscape of Indiana prior to the Ice Age can be deduced by observing the landscape of nearby regions that were never covered by the glaciers. This area of Brown County can be described as a maturely dissected low plateau. It contains hills and knobs separated by lower valleys cut by rivers. The bedrock of the region basically consists of parallel horizontal layers that have not been disturbed by much folding or faulting. This is the way all of Indiana appeared before the invasion of the ice sheets. Road cuts through the hills in the southern part of the state exposed layers of sedimentary bedrock, which was deposited about 350 million years ago. Road cuts through hills in the northern and central regions of the state, such as this one near Rockville, do not expose the bedrock. The glacial drift covers much of the northern two-thirds of Indiana to depths of several hundred feet. Although the bedrock of southern Indiana appears to be horizontal, actually it is tilted slightly. Indiana lies on the western part of a large upfold in the rock, a dome called the Cincinnati Arch. The landscape of southern Indiana is the direct result of this bedrock feature. Southern Indiana is broken down into seven physiographic regions. The regions alternate between uplands with many hills and valleys and lowlands or plains which are generally flat. Regions where hard erosion resistant rock layers cut the surface become uplands, shown here as the darker areas. The Norman upland in south central Indiana is composed of a resistant mixture of limestone and shale of Mississippian age, about 350 million years old. Brown County is in this region. To the west of the Norman upland is the Mitchell Plain, a region of pure limestone that has been under the attack of the slightly acidic groundwater of the area for the past 330 million years. As a result, this region has been worn down into a karst plain, which is riddled with caves and sinkholes. Caves form only in regions underlain by limestone or dolomite. Acidic solutions dissolve the mineral calcite, the predominant mineral of limestone. Streams in the region are slightly acidic due to dissolved carbon dioxide. 
Over the years, wherever a stream flows underground, it dissolves away the bedrock. Another feature of karst topography is Indiana's Lost River. The limestone bedrock of this dry stream bed is full of cracks and crevices through which the river has percolated. Except during times of heavy rain, the Lost River flows completely underground along much of its route. It emerges from a hillside underneath a roadway near Orangeville in Orange County. The spring begins the downstream segment of the Lost River where it begins flowing on the surface. These falls on McCormick's Creek in Owen County were formed as the creek cut its way unevenly through the Mississippian limestone of the Crawford Upland, the hilly region west of the Mitchell Plains. Before the Ice Age, the landscape of northern and central Indiana was determined by the bedrock, just as it is in the case of the southern third of the state today. The present-day landscape of the northern two-thirds of the state is a direct result of the ice sheets. The central third of the state is a flat or gently rolling region called the Tipton Till Plain. The best farmland in the state lies in this region. It is composed of glacial till, a type of unsorted sediment composed of a mixture of clay, sand, and cobbles that was deposited by the ice sheets as they retreated to the north. A couple of notable exceptions exist in the overall flatness of the till plain, however. In east central Indiana, Sugar Creek has cut through the till and exposed the layers of Pennsylvanian sandstone that lie beneath. The northern third of Indiana is an area of lakes and moraines. A glacier carries a great deal of mixed debris as it moves over an area. If the climate conditions are right, a glacier's front edge may remain stationary for many hundreds of years. During this time, the ice within the glacier continues to move forward. The moving ice carries the mixed debris with it. As this debris reaches the front edge of the glacier, where melting is occurring, it is dropped. It eventually forms a large pile or ridge of till called an end moraine. Sediment that is carried and then deposited by the melt water of a glacier will be sorted according to the size of the particles. This type of glacial drift, called stratified drift, makes up the Kankakee Outwash Plain, shown here, a broad flat region that lies south of the Valparaiso Moraine. The Kankakee River runs through the Outwash Plain. The soil in the region is good for farming, but flooding is a constant threat due to the flatness of the region. To the north of the Valparaiso Moraine lies an extensive region of lacustrine deposits. Lacustrine refers to the sediments laid down by lake water. The northern areas of Lake, Porter, and Laporte counties consist of ridges of sand dunes separated by low-lying marshy regions. As the ice sheets were retreating, the ancestors of Lake Michigan were forming. The first glacial lake to form in what is now northwest Indiana was what geologists called Lake Chicago. It was a body of water trapped between the glacier on the north and the Valparaiso Moraine on the south. Lake Chicago formed about 15,000 years ago. It changed its size and thus shoreline several times. This map shows three shorelines of Lake Chicago north of the Valparaiso Moraine. The oldest is the Glenwood shoreline. It parallels Route 30 in Merrillville. The Glenwood shoreline is not very apparent because of its age. The Calumet shoreline is clearly evident from the ridges of former sand dunes that line Ridge Road with houses built atop them. The most recent shoreline left by Lake Chicago runs parallel to 15th Avenue in Gary and runs along Route 12 in Eastern Lake and Porter Counties. It is called the Tolston shoreline. These dunes, which resemble those formed more recently along the current shoreline of Lake Michigan, were formed about 11,000 years ago along the Tolston shoreline. As the ice sheets retreated into Canada, the vast quantities of water produced was held in a very large lake called Lake Algonquin, which covered the present areas occupied by Lakes Michigan and Huron. Lake Duluth, the ancestor of Lake Superior, was forming along the western edge of the glacier northwest of Lake Algonquin.
As the ice sheet retreated further, Lake Algonquin merged with Lake Duluth to form the largest glacial lake of the present Great Lakes region, Lake Nipissing. It covered all the area presently occupied by Lakes Superior, Michigan, and Huron. As the ice sheet disappeared, a drainage pattern to the east was opened up along the present-day Hudson River. This lowered the level of Lake Nipissing substantially, but with the mile-thick ice sheets gone, the crust of the earth began to spring back, like a mattress with a bowling ball lifted from it. This caused the water to the north to spill southward again to occupy the former shoreline at Tolston. This occurred about 4,000 years ago. The present shoreline of Lake Michigan is about a mile north of the Tolston shoreline and is at elevation 580 feet, 25 feet lower than the Tolston shoreline. This is Arch Rock on Mackinac Island at the north end of Lake Michigan. The rock was formed by wave action when Lake Chicago existed at the Tolston shoreline. The rock is much more than 25 feet above the present level of uh, Lake Michigan, however. The ice sheets were thicker and heavier here than they were at the southern tip of the lake and thus depressed the crust deeper into the Earth's mantle. The resulting rebound was proportionately greater. Sand dunes in a current stage of formation can be seen in Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore at West Beach. The small ridge of sand paralleling the beach is called a foredune. Marum grass is the main anchor for the sand in this stage of development. Large tree-covered dunes occur south of the foredune. Grapevines and cottonwood trees dominate here. Sand dunes are ecologically fragile. Where the anchor plants have been disturbed, the wind takes over and creates a blowout, shown here. This is a deflation hollow devoid of plants. The Ice Age began over a million years ago. Some scientists say it started two million years ago or more. This map shows the extent of the glaciation during the height of the Ice Age, about 200,000 years ago. There were several glacial advances during the Ice Age, separated by periods of relative warmth. The earliest series of advances is called the Nebraskan Stage. Little evidence remains of this early period of glaciation. Following the Nebraskan Stage, beginning about 700,000 years ago, was a series of several advances known as the Kansan Stage. The only Kansan drift deposits in Indiana occur in northern Brown County. The Illinoisan stage began about 300,000 years ago, and its ice sheets encroached farther south than any previous stage, or any stage since. The last ice advance, the one mainly responsible for Indiana's topography, is called the Wisconsin stage. It intruded as far south as south-central Indiana. In addition to the erosional scars left by the ice sheets, such as the basins of the Great Lakes, the glaciers also produced smaller lakes, known as Tettle Lakes. Large chunks of ice breaking loose from the front edge of a retreating ice sheet sink deep into the outwash plain, creating a depression called a kettle. The meltwater from the glaciers may fill these depressions, creating a small but deep lake. This is a huge boulder composed of granite, but there is no granite bedrock in Indiana. This boulder is known as a glacial erratic. It was transported to its present position from Canada by the Wisconsin ice sheets. Glacial erratics dot the countryside in many regions of northern Indiana. Two types of glacial drift have already been mentioned. This small hill is called a came. It is composed of stratified drift that was deposited by meltwater cascading from the top of an ice sheet onto the outwash plain. Larger and more elongated than cames, moraines are composed of till unsorted sediment that was deposited directly by the ice of a glacier. The northern third of Indiana contains many end moraines. This is the Valparaiso Moraine. A map showing the location of end moraines also shows that the Wisconsin glacier consisted of three lobes of ice. The Michigan lobe came down from the northwest, the Huron lobe from the north, and the Erie lobe from the northeast. Each time a retreating ice lobe Paused for a few hundred years, an end moraine formed. The Ice Age drastically altered the drainage pattern of Indiana, as well as much of the Midwest. This is the Ohio River. Prior to the Ice Age, it did not exist here. A river that geologists call the Taze River ran through northern Indiana from Ohio. 
The Taze River was the ancestor of the present-day Ohio. Clifty Falls on Clifty Creek near Madison was formed when the newly formed Ohio River carved a 500-foot deep channel in the bedrock across the area where Clifty Creek flowed. The falls have carved their way five miles upstream from their original location, where the creek was captured by the Ohio River. The Ohio River is the largest river of the eastern Midwest. It is an important inland waterway. Many Hoosier towns and cities, such as Madison, have been built along the Ohio River. Today, the Wabash River drains most of north central Indiana and western Indiana. It merges with the Ohio River in the southwest corner of the state. This is Big Blue River at Edinburgh. It is part of the White River drainage basin. The east and west forks of the White River drain most of central and south central Indiana. Most rivers in Indiana drain to the south and west, eventually emptying into the Mississippi River. But north of the Valparaiso Moraine and east of the Moranal system of northeast Indiana, the rivers flow north and east into the Great Lakes. A continental divide thus crosses northern Indiana. In summary, Indiana can be divided into three regions. The southern third consists of seven physiographic regions, shown here, that are a result of the bedrock in Indiana. These regions alternate between hilly highland regions and flat plains or lowlands. The northern two-thirds of the state owes its landscape to the ice sheets. The central third, called the Tipton Till Plain, is covered with a thick deposit of glacial till and is generally flat. Lake Michigan and the other Great Lakes are temporary features of North America. If left undisturbed, the lakes will eventually fill with sediment in a process known as eutrophication. Due to the size of the lakes, this process will take many hundreds of thousands of years. It is quite possible that a new glacial advance will take place before then. It is impossible to know for sure, but most scientists believe that we are living in a warm interglacial period within a much longer period of ice. The Ice Age may not be over yet.